Citizens Division of Extension in the Ashland County Office. This program is co-hosted by Extension Ashland County and the Wisconsin Department of Health Services. I wanna thank my co-host, Amy Nozel. She's the Community Development Specialist in Iron County, and she's helping me with today's program. First, a bit of housekeeping. We are recording this presentation and I'll post it in about 10 minutes on the Ashland, in about 10 days on the Ashland County Extension website. You'll get a link to that website in a follow-up email that I'll send after this morning's program. I welcome you to type your questions or comments in the chat box, and Amy and I will go through them at the end of the speaker's presentation. We'll also be putting several links in the chat throughout the program, so you can find more information about this topic as we go, and I'll include all those links in the follow-up email I'll send after the program. Before our speaker begins, I have a short anonymous poll that will take about one minute. It's just four questions. Your demographic information will help us ensure that our programs reach diverse audiences as required by our federal funders and partners. So I'm gonna just run this first poll for you. We'll take about 10 more seconds. Five more seconds. Okay, I'll end the poll. And I just wanted to share some results with you um, so that you and our speakers can understand a little bit better about how we've experienced techs and how they've affected our health. It looks like a lot of people, more people, 53% have not had a tick-borne illness compared to 31% who have, and about 16% who are not sure. And that's an important part of a tick-borne illness. Sometimes it's not clear whether you actually have a tick-borne illness or not. Most people, it looks like, have had um, Lyme disease or other. And it looks like we're pretty well split on what you'd like to learn about. Tick bite prevention, removal, signs and symptoms comes out a little bit ahead of everything. And then testing, diagnosis, and treatment. Most of us today are from Wisconsin, which is great. Rebecca Osborne, our speaker, will be addressing Wisconsin ticks. And most of us are here as private individuals wanting to know more about ticks and our health. So thank you for taking that poll. The second poll I wanna launch for you is about um, your demographic questions. Just a little bit about yourself. These are four questions. Um, it's anonymous, and this is the poll that helps us get results that we can share with our funders to ensure that we're reaching all of our audiences. Take about 10 more seconds. All right, thank you so much for taking that poll, those two polls with us. So why are we bringing you this program today? Well, 
May was National Lyme Disease Prevention Month when we started this series. And this is usually the month when ticks in all stages of their life cycles are emerging from their winter hideouts. They're hungry and they're looking for hosts. So it's a good time of year to talk about ticks. We live in Northern Wisconsin and our biggest neighbor is Lake Superior, which at times can be quite powerful and sometimes dangerous. However, it might be that our tiniest neighbors are as threatening to even more people than the big lake. So we wanted to bring in specialists who can fill us in and how these tiny critters can make big impacts in our lives. Wisconsin's epicenter for at least six different tick-borne diseases that are affecting many of us and are also affecting our pets, farm animals, and wildlife. Last week, our program focuses focused on diseases in dogs and cats. And to understand how ticks are problematic for people, we want to share with you today's guest speaker, Rebecca Osborne. Rebecca is a vector-borne epidemiologist in the Bureau of Communicable Diseases at the Wisconsin Department of Health Services. She conducts disease surveillance, outbreak investigations, and public health outreach about the diseases spread by ticks and mosquitoes in Wisconsin. Before coming to DHS, Rebecca worked as a wildlife health biologist at the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources. She has a Master of Public Health degree in Infectious Disease Epidemiology from UW-Madison and a Bachelor of Science degree in Wildlife Biology from Colorado State University. I'm delighted to welcome Rebecca Osborne. Good morning. Thank you for that lovely introduction. I'm just gonna pull up my slides here. Are you all seeing my, my slides okay? Yes, looks great. Perfect. All right, well, thank you all for joining us this morning. Um, it is full swing tick season in Wisconsin. Um, and I understand that, that individuals living in Wisconsin in general, but in particular, Northern Wisconsin are accustomed to living with ticks perhaps, um, but also affected uh, by ticks often. And so it's important that we come together to talk a little bit more about the diseases that they spread and how to identify them, diagnose and treat them. So just a quick intro here. Um, what is a vector? And I know you guys have already um, probably understood what a vector is, but just so that we're all on the same page, um, vectors are, are really just living organisms that can transmit infectious diseases or pathogens between humans or from animals to humans. And in epi epidemiology, we, we um, learn a lot about an epidemiological triad, which is essentially just the schematic here, which um, is important to understand the interactions between your pathogen, which is the germ, the environment, the host, and in vector-borne diseases, like tick-borne diseases, we also have to throw in the vector. And so it's a, it becomes a complicated transmission dynamic um, with a lot of different um, impacts and, and ways that this transmission uh, path can be affected. In the world of vector-borne diseases, a lot of them are, are transmitted by these blood-sucking bugs, so to speak. Ticks, of course, are what we're gonna talk about today, but this also includes things like mosquitoes, lice, and even fleas. What is a tick? Well, ticks are arachnids, so they're related to spiders and mites. They're not technically insects, and they feed exclusively on blood from hosts. And I like to start my talks with some tick trivia because I think ticks are, are, are pretty fascinating, although, of course, they're, um, you know, they cause unfortunate disease burden on humans, but they're a really interesting and fascinating creature to study. Ticks have eight legs, except for in the larval stage. They do not have antenna. So if you, uh, a lot of people might mistake the, the front pair of legs for antenna, but, but those are not antenna. They do just have uh, four legs on each side. Ticks don't actually die in the winter. They simply become inactive and, and burrow under leaf litter for protection from the cold. And they can become active when temperatures are above freezing. So anytime in Wisconsin, including in the winter when we have a, a warm day, it's possible for ticks to be out and about looking for hosts. 
And my favorite, tick saliva, includes anesthetics to keep the bite painless, anticoagulants to keep the host's blood flowing, and immunosuppressors to evade the host's immune response. So ticks have evolved uh, in a way to really be able to bite us uh, without noticing and being completely invisible. So here's a list of tick-borne diseases in Wisconsin. Uh, I have a list here of diseases that some of you may have heard of and some of these diseases maybe you haven't heard of. So I'll just talk through them. And I'm gonna go through some details about each of these diseases a little bit later on the talk. Of course, we have Lyme disease. I assume most of you have heard of Lyme disease. It's a, it's a disease spread by the bacterium Borrelia burgdorferi, but we also have several other tick-borne diseases that are spread by ticks in Wisconsin. Anaplasmosis, ehrlichiosis, babesiosis, Borrelia miyamotoi disease, Powassan virus disease, and then we also have some that are travel associated most often. Um, in other words, people might travel to different states in the United States and return and be diagnosed in Wisconsin. Spotted fever group rickettsiosis, which includes diseases like Rocky Mountain spotted fever, and then typhus fever group rickettsiosis as well, which can, uh, depending on the type, can be louse-borne as well as tick-borne. So here's that same list, but this is ex exclusively the, the, the diseases that are spread by the black-legged tick or the deer tick. So this is the tick that is um, implicated in spreading all of these diseases here on the left. So that includes, again, Lyme, anaplasmosis, ehrlichiosis, a specific kind caused by a germ called Ehrlichia murus oclarensis, babesiosis, Borrelia miyamotoi disease, and Powassan virus. So all of these diseases can be spread by this one type of tick, the black-legged uh, tick, or also commonly called the deer tick. In terms of overall burden of disease in Wisconsin, we do see both tick and mosquito-borne diseases, but as you can see from this chart in green, this is, and these data are from 2019, but this would be uh, similar if I pulled data from any, any of the more recent years. Um, Lyme disease makes up the largest proportion by far of all of the vector-borne diseases that are reported to the Department of Health Services, 82%. And then um, this portion in red is anaplasmosis and ehrlichiosis, another 2% for other tick-borne diseases. And then this blue here is mosquito-borne. Um, so really it's, it's just to show you that 90% of all reported vector-borne diseases in Wisconsin are from ticks. Here's a look at our national map. So it's a perspective of how we compare to other states. And this is looking at disease cases from ticks between 2004 and 2016 that were reported to the CDC. And you can see Wisconsin here is in the darkest color, the top 20% of all states uh, that in terms of the highest number of tick-borne diseases reported from our state. So we're among uh, lots of states in the Northeast as well as Minnesota and the upper Midwest as the what's considered the high incidence locations for not only Lyme disease, but other tick-borne diseases as well. And here's a slide just showing the unique history of tick-borne disease emergence in Wisconsin. So we have a pretty fascinating uh, story in our state uh, for whatever reason that, that, that scientists are still studying and we may never fully understand. We, we seem to be a, a very unique hotspot for not only high incidence of tick-borne diseases, but emergence of, of new tick-borne pathogens. So here's just an example of some of the more notable ones. In, in 1968, the, fir the very first case of Lyme disease was actually reported from an individual in Wisconsin. Um, it, was, it was identified retrospectively as Lyme disease, but at the time it was described by a dermatologist, a, a patient who had presented with EM rash, the erythema migrans rash, which is that classic bullseye rash that can, that can um, occur in many cases of Lyme disease. Um, a couple years later, there was the cluster of, of pediatric cases in Lyme, Connecticut, where Lyme disease was first officially described um, and named after Lyme, the, the location. So that's where it got its name, but technically the first case of Lyme disease was, it was from an individual in Wisconsin. Uh, 
a few years later, we had a, a, a first cluster in the Midwest that was identified for Lyme, for Lyme disease. And then in the early 80s, we had one of the first reported clusters in the Midwest in the Northwestern region of the state of, for babesiosis, which is a, a parasitic disease. I'll talk about that in, in a few minutes. In the early 90s, uh, Wisconsin was the very first state to report a first, the first few cases of anaplasmosis, which is another bacterial disease. And then more recently in 2009 was when this new uh, agent, Ehrlichia muris subspecies oclarensis, which is a pathogen that causes ehrlichiosis, was first discovered in individuals from Wisconsin and Minnesota. And then in 2013, uh, another pathogen that was uh, completely new, previously undiscovered, Borrelia maonii, was detected in, in, all, in also in individuals who live in Wisconsin and Minnesota. Borrelia maonii is a cause of Lyme disease. It's a, a rare cause of Lyme disease, but it can occur. So before we jump into more details about all of the diseases, I did want to talk a little bit about how disease surveillance works in our state. Um, <clears throat> of course, we <clears throat> generally disease surveillance is, is relatively passive. So all that means is, is that most uh, diseases depend on healthcare providers, laboratories to, to report diseases to us. So there's, there's, if we don't get the report from a health, uh, a laboratory or a healthcare facility, we often don't know about it. Um, according to, to Wisconsin state statute, the health department may establish systems of disease surveillance to ascertain the presence of any communicable disease. And it's, it's also our responsibility as a health department um, to uh, you know, to monitor these diseases and take necessary steps to, to try and prevent them. So how does an individual end up in our surveillance system? And this is just a general schematic. So if you apply this to tick-borne diseases, obviously this exposure here would be a tick bite, but a, an exposure of some type needs to occur. Um, and then an individual needs to develop an infection and that infection must then cause clinical symptoms or signs so that the person feels ill. They must, that person must seek healthcare at a clinic or a hospital and be evaluated by a clinician. They, they must also um, be tested or clinically diagnosed with a disease. And that clinical diagnosis or that positive test then generates a report, which not only gets sent back to the healthcare facility, but also gets reported to the state public health department or the local public health department. We have a, a electronic disease surveillance system that we call WEDS for Wisconsin Electronic Disease Surveillance System that is able to receive electronic laboratory reports and electronic um, clinical case reports, essentially a, a provider might be submitting a report to us saying that they diagnosed a person with Lyme disease, for example, um, and send some symptoms over and the patient information. Um, so that's generally how we receive these reports. Here's an example of what WEDS might look like. This is just, of course, a, a pretend patient, but um, this is an image of what our system can capture. Um, and how we might track these disease reports. So what are, what are the goals of disease surveillance? Well, really we're, we're just interested in, in these main three questions. Who in the population is affected? What is the pattern of occurrence? And what are the contributing risks? And all the data we collect is really intended to help us with this end goal of trying to prevent disease. So all of the answers to these questions and all the data we collect is, is, is essentially trying to help us understand where we might be able to apply interventions or provide some you know, outreach and education or boost laboratory testing and how can we improve um, diagnosis, treatment and prevention. So what data are, are collected uh, when, when we conduct public health surveillance? 
generally we have demographic data. So that would include address, age, sex, race and, race and ethnicity. And these are data that are important for a variety of reasons. Address is important because as a home rule state, Wisconsin um, has the, the local county or the, the local public health department has jurisdiction over the individual cases that occur in their, um, essentially in, in their jurisdiction. So, so we need to have that address level data to know which jurisdiction is responsible for investigating that case. Of course, we're also interested in age and sex information, who's affected and, and race and ethnicity data as well. We also collect laboratory test results, clinical data, which includes signs and symptoms, might include clinical lab findings, you know, like if somebody gets a, a complete blood count or blood chemistries or a metabolic panel, things like that, comorbidities and health history. So this would include underlying um, conditions that that individual may already have that could affect their outcomes or their risk of developing severe illness, and then treatment information as well. We also are really interested in risk factors for exposure. So for tick bites, um, tick-borne diseases specifically, we're, we're interested in knowing if the person had a known tick bite. If they did not have a known tick bite, did they have at least exposure to ticks or tick habitat? What is their occupation or occupational setting that might put them in at risk for tick-borne contact? And then we also try and collect information about other modes of transmission, which are very rare in the, in the example of, of vector-borne diseases, especially tick-borne diseases, but it is possible um, for some of them that disease can be transmitted through blood transfusion or organ transplantation or laboratory exposure, like an individual who works in a lab who might have, say, a needle stick or something that might expose them to a pathogen. And so <clears throat> for all of those data that we collect, like I mentioned, we, we work really hard to try and um, collect high quality data so that we can do the, our, our best work in, in analyzing those data, better understanding what's occurring in Wisconsin, reporting those data out to, to our partners and the public and trying to figure out where are the best places to, to try and prevent these diseases from happening. We have other priorities as well. Um, in terms of, of just our core sur disease surveillance. So we just talked a little bit about how disease surveillance works. And um, here are some of the things that, that, involve, that are involved in, in disease surveillance. Um, but we also have other goals, disease vector and host surveillance. So that would be um, looking at tick populations and um, the, the hosts that ticks bite. So, so a lot of that times that includes small mammals, wildlife populations, deer, um, tick distribution, expansion of their range, and also infection rates in ticks. So how many ticks on the landscape are, are infected and so on. We also conduct a lot of disease, or sorry, data analysis. So once we have all those data from our disease surveillance and our, and our tick surveillance, we try and, and answer questions about, you know, where is disease most likely to occur? Who are the populations at risk? And then try and present those data in a, in a, useful way um, to explain what it is that we're learning from our data. And then of course, the pie in the sky disease, uh, disease prevention. So we conduct educational campaigns and we also do clinician outreach uh, with providers. Okay, so now we're gonna talk a little bit more in detail about the diseases spread by ticks, the, cl the clinical signs and symptoms that they um, co that commonly occur with each of these diseases, and a little bit about transmission, and, and eventually I'll get to testing and diagnosis and treatment. So of course we'll start with Lyme disease, the main um, tick-borne disease in Wisconsin that causes a significant amount of, of disease and morbidity in our population. In Wisconsin, it's, it's a disease that's caused by a bacterial infection with either Borrelia burgdorferi, which is by far the most common uh, specific bacterium that causes Lyme disease, or rarely this new pathogen Borrelia meonii. Borrelia meonii, like I mentioned before, was first discovered in 2013 in patients from Wisconsin and Minnesota who at the time were thought to have a Borrelia burgdorferi infection. 
transmission of Lyme disease occurs after an infected tick has been attached for at least 24 to 36 hours. And the incubation period, which is the time from tick bite or first infection to the development of the first symptoms. So when somebody gets ill, that incubation period, the time between infection and, and symptoms developing ranges anywhere from three to 30 days. So it's a pretty big window. And Lyme disease, all the diseases that I'm talking about today are, are spread by the black-legged tick or the deer tick. Lyme disease is a multi-phase, multi-system disease. So that's, this is kind of what it means to be multi-phase and multi-system. It it's, uh, has a few different disease progressions. Untreated Lyme disease can progress from what's called early localized disease to early disseminated disease and on to late disseminated disease. And again, this is if it's untreated. So we'll talk a little bit about, about what each of those uh, phases might look like. So, and these are typical Lyme disease manifestations or, or presentations for each of these phases. So early localized disease might include things like erythema migraines rash or that bullseye rash. That's generally when that first sign uh, would develop as the rash. It's commonly associated with flu-like symptoms. So fever, body aches, joint pain, you know, fatigue, just feeling unwell altogether. Swollen lymph nodes can develop as well as a sign of infection. If untreated after about one to three months, early disseminated disease can develop, and that may include multiple EM rashes, things like facial palsy, meningitis, so inflammation of the meninges around your brain, and even cardiac issues. And then if left untreated for three or more months, late disseminated disease can develop. And in that phase, we generally see things like arthritis, peripheral nerve damage, and cognitive impairment. So let's talk a little bit about EM rash. On the right are images of a wide variety of ways that EM rash or the bullseye rash can look. So it's not always the classical bullseye that you might think, which is sort of this one on the bottom right. Um, it does occur in about 70 to 80% of cases. The incubation for the EM rash specifically is about three to 30 days, but on average, it will develop any, uh, about 11 days after infection. It's typically round and red, gray, or brown, depending on skin tone. It's rarely painful or itchy. And it expands slowly over multiple days to uh, at least a five centimeter diameter. Um, this image here at the bottom is pointing out that, that some redness around a tick bite area is not always the sign of infection. Um, you know, obviously most people who develop EM rash, the EM rash will develop around the site of the tick bite itself, although not always. Um, but not all redness or rashes are a sign of Lyme disease. So the redness in this picture here is just caused by um, uh, irritation or even an allergy to the, the tick saliva itself. So it gets a little bit inflamed and red. Um, and that's not a sign of a tick-borne infection. That's just your body's reaction to the bite itself. These uh, allergic reactions are generally small. So they the way to distinguish them is they're usually much smaller than, than five centimeters in diameter, and they do not expand over time like an EM rash does. So here's a look at our data for Lyme disease over the last few decades. Um, and you can see that or in the 90s, we had certainly some cases, but as soon as the, the 2000s hit, we really started to see exponential increase in, in Lyme cases in Wisconsin. And then I'll point out here in the most recent uh, decade or so, we have had some surveillance changes that have affected uh, not only the number of, of diseases that we've counted, but um, kind of our certain classifications. Um, so in 2008, the, the a probable disease uh, definition was added. So that's just 
um, another way to count a case that may not have quite as robust as evidence as a confirmed case, but we did still feel like there was sufficient evidence to, evidence to count it as a true case of Lyme. And then because uh, the, the number of Lyme disease reports in our public health system was becoming so high, our local public health partners were struggling to keep up with investigating every single one. So we came up with uh, essentially an algorithm to try and estimate cases that may not have had uh, an investigation associated with them. So that's what this, this gray bar is really representing. You can see for our most recent data in 2021, um, we have a pretty record year. Um, 20, 2020 data were probably affected largely by COVID. Um, and we're looking into sort of all the different ways that, that COVID may have affected our data. But, but in 2021, we have unfortunately seen quite a rebound uh, uh, in terms of total Lyme cases. These, these minor fluctuations um, are relatively insignificant overall though. Over the past decade plus, you know, 10 to 15 years, we have had sustained high levels of Lyme disease. And that's what we see every year. Um, so unfortunately it's endemic, it's not going away. And we, we really don't see any evidence of, 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 the, of a decrease in cases. I did also wanna show you quick the, the surveillance data for Lyme disease caused by Borrelia meonia. Now this is that new uh, bacterium that was discovered recently. And like I said, it's a rare cause of Lyme disease. So, so if you look back at, at this slide, we have an on average of about 3,800 cases of Lyme reported in Wisconsin. Um, for, for Lyme disease caused by Borrelia meonii, we have an average of one case every year. So that's, that's how rare it is. There's certainly a chance that we're under, under counting cases and this occurs generally across the board in public health. We, our systems are really not able to catch every single case, but um, you know, we, we're, we still find the data very valuable. So, so these averages are, are likely under counting, but, but generally we, you know, we're not seeing a lot of disease transmission from, from uh, this particular pathogen. All right, so let's talk a little bit about anaplasmosis and some of these other tick-borne diseases that occur in our state. And I'm gonna kind of run through these a little bit more quickly, just as a sort of an overview. Um, but if anybody does have questions at the end, feel free to, to uh, ask at that point. Anaplasmosis is caused by a bacterial infection with anaplasma phagocytophilum. It is the second most common illness spread by ticks in Wisconsin, so it's relatively common. Transmission of anaplasmosis occurs after an infected tick has been attached for at least 12 to 24 hours, so a little bit less time, attachment time is needed for transmission of this particular bacteria. And the incubation period for anaplasmosis ranges from anywhere from five to 14 days. What about the signs and symptoms of anaplasmosis? Well, it typically ca causes an acute febrile illness. So that's that flu-like illness again, where you just feel, you may have a fever, you feel achy, fatigued, body pain. Most cases are mild to moderate and self-limiting, but severe illness and death are certainly possible. Risk factors for severe disease include delays in treatment, an older age, or immune compromising conditions. And here's a look at what some of the symptoms can, common symptoms of, of anaplasmosis are. In early illness, you see these flu-like symptoms. I'll note that you can also develop GI symptoms. It's um, not in 100% of cases, but it's, it's relatively common. So sometimes these illnesses are, are misdiagnosed as a GI bug, like, um, you know, norovirus or something. And, and so it's important to, for for not only patients, but providers to be aware of these symptoms. Late illness without treatment can develop into uh, pretty serious uh, uh, symptoms of an individual who's, especially who might be on immunocompromising medications or have an immunocompromising condition, including being um, in an older age group. 
And then here's what our surveillance data looks like for anaplasmosis. We have about uh, 500 cases a year in Wisconsin. Um, we saw a little bit of a decrease over the last few years, but again, unfortunately in 2021, we, we saw it kind of pop back up to what we had been expecting. Air leakiosis is another one that can occur in Wisconsin. It's caused by an infection with one of two Ehrlichia species bacteria. So we have Ehrlichia murus oclorensis, or sometimes we might call it EME, or another pathogen called Ehrlichia chaffiensis. EME is transmitted by the black-legged or the deer tick, so this one up here, whereas Ehrlichia chaffiensis is transmitted by the lone star tick, Amblyoma americanum, which is this tick down here. Uh, the Lone Star tick is, is not very common in Wisconsin, although there's evidence that it's expanding northward up into our state. So we certainly have documented Lone Star ticks in Wisconsin, especially in the southern part of the state, um, but it's still considered, you know, it, compared to the, the populations of black-legged ticks, it's much less common. Transmission of ehrlichiosis occurs after an infected tick has been attached for at least 12 to 20, 24 hours. So that's the same as anaplasmosis. And the incubation period is also uh, about the same from five to 14 days. Ehrlichia and anaplasma infections are very similar. Um, there are a few differences that I'll point out. So ehrlichiosis also calls, causes an acute febrile illness. It can develop into severe illness and death. Um, a lot of the risk factors are the same, although we do have a very young age can also put you at high risk for severe disease, as well as being an older age. Um, some of the symptoms are similar. Um, you can see rash in ehrlichiosis. It's not an EM rash, but it's a, a different kind of rash, especially in children can develop. Um, and if left untreated, um, it can also develop into some pretty serious uh, manifestations. Overall, we see very relatively few cases of ehrlichiosis caused by this new pathogen, E. murus oclorensis, about 10 on average. Uh, for ehrlichiosis caused by Ehrlichia chaffiensis, which a lot of these are travel associated, but we see about 50 a year. Um, some of these may also, because a lot of these are identified using antibody testing, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, some of these may also actually be Ehrlichia murus oclorensis cases, but they're just being reported as Ehrlichia chaffiensis. Babesiosis is caused by a protozoal infection with Babesia microti. So this is a, a parasite essentially that, that infects your red blood cells. Other species of Babesia are rare causes of human disease, mostly this one, Babesia microti. Transmission occurs after an infected tick has been attached for at least 36 to 48 hours, so it does take some time. And the incubation period ranges from one to nine weeks. So this one can take some time to develop, especially in people who are immunocompromised, might see an, a, a really long incubation period. Babesiosis also causes a, a flu-like illness, but it can often be accompanied by anemia because it does attack your red blood cells. Um, again, most cases are mild, but there are certainly um, cases that develop uh, more severe um, symptoms and can lead to death. Risk factors for severe disease include not having a spleen, older age, and immunocompromising, immunocompromising conditions. And then here's a look at some of the common symptoms for early and late illness. We can have a lot of these nonspecific symptoms, fever, chills, you know, body aches. Um, anemia can occur, jaundice can occur. And then in late illness, we can get some really serious um, anemic conditions, very low platelet count, organ failure, so on. On average, we have about 54 cases of babesiosis every year. Um, so it certainly can occur, and we're we're seeing again these trends that that we're we're suspecting there's been a, a bit of an increase in cases. Borrelia miyamotoi disease. Some of you may never have heard of this before. Um, it is a bacterial infection caused by Borrelia miyamotoi. It's also a spirochete, this spiral-shaped bacteria that's uh, very similar to to the 
uh, bacterium that causes Lyme disease, but it is kind of in a different family of Borrelia bacteria. Borrelia miyamotoi can be transmitted transovarially from adult females to her eggs. So that just means that the larval ticks, those babies that hatch out of eggs, may be infected. And this is unique to, to Miyamotoi. Um, not many other tick-borne diseases that we see in Wisconsin um, have uh, the, the possibility for larval ticks to be infected. It's essentially um, just the nymphal and the adult ticks that, that can, can infect people because they've taken a blood meal from a host and then become infected. But in this case, Miyamotoi can be passed from the adult female to her eggs. Transmission occurs after an infected tick has been attached for uh, less than 24 hours. And we're not, we, ha we don't have enough data to know exactly what the minimum attachment time is for this transmission to occur. Incubation period ranges from anywhere from a few days to a few weeks. Again, more data are needed to really nail down a more specific incubation period for, for this disease. Once again, you'll see a trend here. It commonly causes um, an acute febrile illness, that flu-like illness. This can be part of why it's so hard to diagnose these diseases. They, they can mimic a lot of, they can mimic each other and they can mimic a lot of other diseases that uh, commonly cause fever and these sort of non-specific flu-like symptoms. Most infections can be mild to moderate, but certainly hospitalizations have been documented. In Wisconsin, about 25% of our cases have been hospitalized. Risk factors for more severe disease are really not clearly, clearly defined yet, so more data are needed. And from what data we do have, this is a typical presentation of uh, early disease um, or sort of a mild case. Um, and then if somebody does end up in, uh, with a more severe case, we have uh, documented encephalitis uh, and meningitis, so inflammation of the brain and meninges, as well as low platelet counts. And so far, no deaths due to Borrelia miyamotoi disease have been documented. Borrelia miyamotoi is still uh, considered quite rare in Wisconsin, so we have on average about three cases per year. And then Powassan virus disease. So this is the last disease we're going to look at um, in some detail. This is uh, a viral infection, so caused, of course, by the Powassan virus. Powassan is the only known virus spread by ticks in Wisconsin. Transmission occurs after infected tick has been attached for less than 12 hours. It's not clear exactly how long attachment time, um, how long of an attachment time is needed for, for Powassan virus to be transmitted, but in a laboratory setting, which doesn't necessarily represent real life, but in a laboratory setting, um, Powassan was transmitted in as, as little as 15 minutes from a tick to a mouse. Um, so it, transmission time for Powassan virus is believed to be quite fast. The incubation period for Powassan from tick bite or infection to, to symptoms is anywhere from about one to four weeks. And once again, Powassan typically causes a, a, an acute febrile illness. Um, some infections can be mild or even asymptomatic or subclinical, but um, Powassan virus can develop into severe neuroinvasive illness, and certainly we, the deaths have been documented. Risk factors for the severe neuroinvasive presentation include older age and immunocompromising conditions. Um, here's some common symptoms for that acute um, flu-like stage of illness, and then if, if the, the infection does go on to, to involve the central nervous system, people can can experience confusion, loss of coordination, difficulty speaking, seizures, um, encephalitis, meningitis, so on. Um, Powassan is also considered quite rare in Wisconsin. We have on average about five cases a year, um, although there's some, some evidence that, that it, we're getting a little bit of an increase in cases. All right, so as we showed before, um, you know, all of these diseases are, are spread by the same type of tick. So because of that, we can have co-infections. And what this means is, is essentially a tick-borne co-infection can occur in individuals bitten by a single tick that is infected with multiple pathogens or potentially by concurrent tick bites 
so ticks, you know, bitten by more than one tick um, that are infected with a single pathogen. So people can be infected um, with more than one pathogen at a time. Limited data are available on the number of co-infections and the specific details about clinical features. Um, and the reason that, that we have a, such a hard time collecting clear data on co-infections is that oftentimes um, antibody testing or what we might call serologic testing methods are used to diagnose a lot of these tick-borne diseases. And this type of testing really cannot easily differentiate between like a concurrent infection, things happening at the same time, or sequential infections. Like if you've had a tick-borne illness in the past and are then experiencing a new one currently. So we'll talk a little bit more about testing and the limitations of those in a, in a few minutes, but that's one of the reasons why we don't have a lot of good data on, on tick-borne uh, tick co-infections, how often they occur. The other reason why we don't have a lot of data on co-infections is that um, treatment recommendations for a lot of these tick-borne diseases are uh, overlap. So in other words, the same antibiotic that can treat Lyme disease is also very effective at treating anaplasmosis. And so because of that, a lot of times patients are treated effectively and then testing to document a co-infection is often neither cost-effective nor necessary. So if you're feeling better and are, are recovering, there's not a lot of incentive for you or your doctor to, you know, to get you back into the, the clinic, um, order a bunch of additional tests and see if you might have had a co-infection. In Wisconsin, the data that we do have suggests that Lyme disease and anaplasmosis co-infections are probably the most common type of co-infection, which is no surprise considering those are our, our highest um, burden diseases that we have. But, uh, but Lyme disease, babesiosis co-infections may certainly also occur. And in general, data really suggests that co-infections may cause more severe and or more persistent symptoms. It's unclear, however, whether this more severe presentations or more persistent symptoms are due to things like reporting bias, which means that, you know, the more severe cases are just more likely to be reported. Um, it could also be due to sort of true interactions between the pathogens or maybe between the host immune system and the pathogens. So how, how those interactions might work may in fact cause more severe or persistent symptoms. Or this also could just be due to delayed diagnosis and treatment. So in some cases, especially with things like Lyme disease and babesiosis co-infections where um, the treatment for these two diseases is different, um, people might be reporting more severe, more persistent symptoms because they're not getting adequate treatment for both of these infections. There is no evidence that co-infection increases the risk for disseminated Lyme disease or Lyme disease complications. So that's um, uh, really good news there. All right, so we're gonna talk a little bit more about disease epidemiology, and then I'll go into some disease uh, treatment information, and then we'll wrap up. Um, so I'm gonna kind of go through this quickly, but I did just want to show you some other useful information that we obtained from our, our surveillance. So a lot of this has to do with um, identifying risk and who is at risk and when are they at risk. So here's a look at seasonal risk of Lyme disease. So as you may expect, you know, we don't see equal risk all year long. There is a season to Lyme and, and tick um, activity. So generally we see cases of uh, being most common in June and July, although it is important to note that infection is possible year round. And this is largely due to the deer tick life cycle. So some of you may already be familiar with this, but of course we have four life stages for a deer tick, eggs, larvae, nymph, and adult. Um, here's a CDC schematic of, of just how a typical deer tick life cycle might look. Um, and essentially this is just showing you um, you know, the eggs hatch into larvae. The larvae have to take a blood meal. They overwinter and develop into nymphs. Um, for Lyme disease and most other tick-borne diseases, it's the nymph is the first life stage that can be infected and pass uh, an infection onto a, a, another host, including a person. Um, and it's, it's in the spring 
an early summer when the nymphs are most active. So this is why we see the highest number of disease cases because um, nymphs are harder to, to find on your body. So they're generally left to, uh, to be attached for a longer period of time, which allows for that infection and the disease transmission to occur. Um, so that's why you see the, the peak when it is. We do also see kind of a, um, adult populations come out in the fall and again, kind of really early first thing in the spring. So you certainly adults can also um, transmit disease, but they're a little bit easier to find and remove quickly. And so that can prevent disease transmission in the first place. So here's a look at the seasonal deer act tick activity. Like I just explained, this is looking at adults. They kind of come out in the spring sort of go away for most of the summer and then come out again in the fall. Here's a look at the nymphal tick activity where we see this big peak in, in the, the sort of spring and summer. Um, and then larval ticks, you can kind of see a, a few um, peaks of them in the sort of early summer and then later part of the summer. Now larvae are again for most tick-borne diseases in Wisconsin that do not spread any pathogens because they are usually not infected. They haven't taken a blood meal yet. And that's, that's usually, except for that Borrelia miyamotoi disease exception, um, that's how they become infected in the first place. So this is kind of what you might see in terms of risk, you know, increasing in the spring, early summer, and then kind of tapering off. And then we might see another bump in the fall. So here's when we, we're, we're in that peak kind of right now. <clears throat> and so this is why we see this peak here in June and July. Nymphal tick activity peaks and then a few weeks pass and then we see a peak in human illness. Here's a look at, at the seasonal activity for anaplasmosis. I'm showing you this because I just wanted to point out that in some cases um, you might see this a little bit of a smaller bump in the fall. And again, that's usually due to, to the adult tick activity. But generally for all of our tick-borne diseases, the, the, the the seasonal risk is pretty much identical. It looks like this, except um, with very small fluctuations. And the last one I wanted to show you for seasonal risk is babesiosis. We do see a slight shift um, of the peak being a little bit later in the summer, and this is just due to that longer incubation period. So again, it's really still the nymphal ticks that are driving a lot of the infections, but because it can take longer for symptoms to occur, we see the peak a little bit later in the summer. Now, what about geographical risk? Well, tick-borne diseases um, don't occur, you know, in this at the same rates across the state. But um, this is just a map looking at uh, tick-borne disease risk by county. You can see that the darker blues are where we have the highest risk. So, anybody in the northern part of the state, or even sort of the northwestern part of the state is at a high risk for getting a tick-borne disease. I do think it's also important to point out though that um, every county in Wisconsin is at some risk for tick-borne disease. So we see not only disease cases, but also the tick itself and infected ticks occurring in every county in Wisconsin. So again, they're most, most common in Northern and Western portions, but, but infections are reported from every county, including in the Southeastern portion of the state. And then here's a quick look at the age-related risk of Lyme disease. Um, we do see a, a pretty high risk in children um, in this group, you know, five to 14, um, and then another peak for the older age group. Um, for a lot of our other diseases, we see, we generally just see an increase like this. This is for anaplasmosis, but th this is what all of the other age-related um, graphics will look like where it just sort of increases with, with older age group. There is also a climate connection here. We Wisconsin has warmed by about one to 1.5 degrees Fahrenheit since 1950. And really the main thing that, um, there's a lot of ways that this can impact ticks and tick populations and also the hosts that they feed on um, and also human behavior. but but the most obvious reason that this affects tick-borne disease risk is that it makes the tick activity season longer. Um, so previously where you know you might have winter start pretty early and get really cold really fast and, and, and spring start a little later, um, 
our warmer winters and longer sort of growing seasons have really extended the tick season. So it just provides more opportunities for human tick encounters. And this can contribute to an increase in, in Lyme disease um, and other tick-borne diseases occurring. And it also is part of why we see tick-borne disease transmission occurring in every month of the year. All right, so I see that we're kind of running out of time here, so I apologize, but I'm gonna fly through this last section here about diagnosis and treatment. Um, and just wanna pull out a few main points about kind of how complicated this can be. Um, a lot of it is, the reason it's complicated is because a lot of these diseases present very similarly with these nonspecific symptoms that not only can mimic each other, but like I said, can mimic a wide variety of other diseases as well. Um, clinical diagnosis of most tick-borne diseases for that reason does rely heavily on lab testing. Um, there's a couple different kinds of lab testing. If you put them in sort of two main buckets, there's direct detection, and that uh, can include things like molecular testing. So PCR is an example, which is a test that de detects fragments of DNA or, or RNA specific to a certain pathogen. You can also use microscopic observation, like a blood smear, which is actually seeing a specific pathogen under a microscope. We also have indirect detection, which is um, things like serologic testing. So that would be <clears throat> an example is an EIA, which stands for an enzyme immunoassay or an immunoblot, things like that. And this detects elevated antibodies against a specific pathogen. So this is not detecting the pathogen itself, it's detecting your immune response to the infection. Um, and here's just a quick schematic of what, what um, why it's important to think about the timing of testing. Um, a lot of times direct detection is useful really early in the disease course within the first two weeks on average of, of when symptoms start. So if you are seen by a clinician and get a specimen drawn within the first two weeks of being sick, um, Something like a PCR test is usually the best option, depends on which disease you're being tested for. But, but then if, if you don't seek treatment right away, but instead um, for whatever reason, can only see a physician a little bit later on in your, in your disease course, that's when antibody testing becomes necessary um, because these direct detect, detection methods often are no longer very useful. So some of this just depends on timing of, of when testing occurs. So for Lyme disease, um, there's some limitations here, but, but generally PCR is not recommended. It has a very low sensitivity, which just means that it's, you're going to get, uh, you, you're most likely to get a negative result, even if you have an, a, a true Lyme disease case. Um, so they're not particularly useful, ex with the exception of, of if somebody has arthritis, Lyme arthritis, taking a, a sample of synovial fluid and, and running a PCR test is, is a very accurate test, meaning a negative test is really able to rule out Lyme disease as the cause of the arthritis. But for Lyme disease, generally we have to rely on serology that, and for Lyme it's, it's called two-tiered testing. Um, that's recommended, it's sort of a two-step test method that looks for different types of antibodies against the Borrelia bacterium. Um, and this, I'm not going to go into detail, but this is sort of just how two-step two testing works or two-tiered testing for Lyme disease works. Essentially, both of the tests need to be positive for the overall test interpretation to be positive. If one or both of the tests are negative, um, then the final result would be negative. So you could even have a positive first test and a negative second test, if that's the case, you would still, the overall interpretation would be negative. So you need to have those two tests to be positive for the overall interpretation to be positive. And that's because the first test is very sensitive. So they, it can create a lot of false positives. Whereas the second test is more specific. So that means it's gonna be able to, 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 to be more, less likely to, to create false positives and more likely to, to detect the actual antibody against Borrelia burgdorferi. So that's why the two-step method is, is important. There's also a modified two-tiered approach that I won't go into, but that's just something that if you are getting testing for a lab, uh, 
or for Lyme disease, you can certainly ask your clinician about. Um, and then I see it's 10 o'clock, so I'm sorry, I'm, I'm kind of running out of time here, but I'll just um, go through one last slide, which is when Lyme disease lab testing is recommended. Um, I think this is an important message because um, a lot of a lot of people get Lyme disease testing. And again, the timing is very important in terms of ter interpretation. So um, in early localized disease, so if you have a fever or EM rash, the test sensitivity is actually really poor, which means that you're, you're really likely to test negative because your body hasn't had enough time to develop antibodies that can be detected by the test. So oftentimes when it's early Lyme disease, um, it's often recommended that your provider just diagnose you clinically based on your symptoms and maybe your exposure history and treat you right away. Testing may or may not be helpful at this point. Um, and oftentimes, if, even if they might not even order a test, which is, which is perfectly acceptable because it's most likely not gonna tell them anything helpful. However, if you have early disseminated disease or late disseminated disease, so if it's been some time since you've had symptoms, the test sensitivity jumps up to be very good, if not excellent. So these are instances when testing is recommended. And if you truly have Lyme disease, your test will be positive because you've had plenty of time to develop those symptoms, or sorry, the antibodies um, detected by, by Lyme. All right, so I'm gonna stop there. I'm sorry for going over a little time, but I wanted to leave a little bit of, of time for questions. Um, if there are any, I'm happy to address them. Well, thanks, Rebecca. That has been really comprehensive. I've got a lot of takeaways from your presentation, mainly that symptoms might be generalized. It might look a lot like flu. We might not even realize we're sick. And so sometimes testing can be a little more complicated, um, but that it is important to keep track of when you're bitten by ticks, when you see ticks on you, and then you can look at a calendar to see, oh, am I feeling really tired or I have a fever or a couple of weeks after I get bit, you can help to find a diagnosis for yourself. Is that kind of a short summary? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think it's important to think through, um, you know, if if you think you might have been bitten by a tick or know you've been, been bitten by a tick, um, it can be a long time until symptoms develop. So with Lyme, it's up to 30 days. You know, it's not common for people to take that long, but it can certainly take a month. And um, for babesiosis, it can take even a little bit longer. So it's just important to sort of, I, I always encourage people to write down on the calendar when you got your tick bite, or even if you were in tick habitat and think you may have been bitten by a tick. And for some people that might be every day, so it might not be worth you know, writing on your calendar, but just keep that in mind that, that symptoms can develop um, quite you know, uh, uh, later than, than the tick bite occurring. So it's important to remember that and talk to your doctor about um, the fact that you think you may have been exposed to a tick. Um, nice. And also that, yeah, that symptoms can mimic a lot of other things. So unfortunately, the test, a lot of times testing is necessary um, to help support a diagnosis, but often the tests themselves can be complicated as well for interpretation. Thanks for that clarification. That's really important. Um, we'll go till about 1015 with questions and we do have some in the chat box. Um, a, a person suggested that in most cases, a tick must be attached for 36 to 48 hours or more before the Lyme disease bacterium can be transmitted. That's what the CDC um, recommends um, that you check for ticks, takes 36 to 48 hours or more before disease is transmitted. So do you, what do you think about that, Rebecca? Is that a good representation of um, what we might expect if a tick is on us? So yeah, for Lyme disease, it's it's generally thought to be around 24 to 36 hours um, of of minimum attachment time for transmission to occur, um, and that's in most cases. And a lot of this these these transmission time estimations are based on um, a variety of different studies, as well as sort of human you know clinical trials, um, and also studying how the the pathogen itself is replicated and, and stored in the tick itself. 
Um, so with Borrelia, for example, the, you know, the, the bacterium generally lives and has to replicate in kind of the mid gut of the, of the tick. So it's kind of way back in its stomach essentially. And for it to be able to transmit, it has to move um, from that area kind of all the way up to its salivary glands. And that process can take some time and there's a whole complicated way that it be can become activated and kind of move through the tick. So um, it, it, it does take some time to, for transmission to occur, which is which gives us a window for prevention, right? Which is why tick checks are so important um, when you think you've been out in tick habitat, because if you remove it promptly, your risk of disease can can decrease drastically. Um, and and as I mentioned in in you know when I reviewed the other diseases, most of the diseases that occur and are spread by the deer tick in Wisconsin take at least 12 to 24 hours um, with perhaps the exception of, of Powassan, which can likely happen much more quickly, but thankfully is very rare. Um, so generally speaking, you know, we have that window to remove the tick and, and reduce our risk by a significant amount. That being said, a lot of people might not know exactly how long the tick's been attached. Um, uh, I didn't have a chance to get to it, but there is, you know, a, a uh, a sort of a way to look at the engorgement. So how, how much it's been filled with blood to estimate the attachment time, um, a flat tick. So one that just pretty much looks flat and not ballooned up is one that's been attached for less than 24 hours. If it's starting to look a little bit, you know, expanded and, um, kind of filling up with blood, then it's probably been attached for more than 24 hours. And so that's a general rule of thumb for you to estimate, well, how long has it been on my body? If it's a flat tick, it's almost certainly been less than 24 hours. And it, it's usually mean, it usually means your, your disease risk is pretty low. So frequent and thorough tick checks are really important. So you can capture that tick, take it off before it gets engorged for any hours. Yes, exactly. Um, another question is uh, from someone who says that decades ago, doctors were offering a preventative vaccination for Lyme, but I don't hear about it much anymore. What are the expectations of future vaccination programs? Yeah, great question. We actually have some really promising news on the Lyme vaccine. There's one in development by Pfizer um, that's actually in, um, in phase three I think they're just starting phase three trials and it's really promising. Um, it, it, it is, I don't have a ton of details yet, but I keep hearing, you know, sort of news that we might expect it to, to come to market in the next, certainly in the next five years, if not sooner. Um, it's been a slow process in trying to get um, pharmaceutical companies to, to, to sort of invest in research on Lyme disease vaccines, but I'm really grateful to hear that this one is coming. It sounds really promising. It should be a pretty pretty broad protection, meaning um, it should be able to protect against you know the the Borrelia burgdorferi bacterium in the United States as well as some of the species in Europe. Um, it will only be for Lyme though, so one thing to consider if you are a Wisconsin resident and um, is if you have, you know, let's say we get our Lyme vaccine and it's really effective, you can feel comforted that you have some protection against Lyme, but it's not gonna protect you against anaplasma, Ehrlichia babesia, all these other diseases. So um, even in the, in the universe where we have a Lyme disease vaccine that's effective at preventing Lyme, we're still gonna need to be worried about um, tick bites and trying to prevent them, so. Mm -hmm. So some hope for Lyme disease, but we still would be vulnerable to the other five that you mentioned, but it's a good start. Yes, absolutely. Since Lyme is, is you know, by far the most common disease, it's still a very, a very significant and promising um, development, so. Mm -hmm. um, this question is, if an individual has Lyme disease symptoms and receives a clinical diagnosis, but not a positive test result, is anything done with that data? Yeah, great question. Um, in Wisconsin, there's two main things that are required reporting by a provider. One is a positive lab test for Lyme, 
And that's usually a really automated system from the lab, like the performing laboratory itself. Um, but if somebody gets diagnosed with Lyme disease, say they come in and yep, they get clinically diagnosed, they get a prescription for doxycycline and they don't need a test, which is perfectly fine. And sometimes, um, you know, uh, the, the best recommendation for people really early in that disease course, um, the, the physician is, is, or the, you know, somebody at the healthcare facility is still required to report EM rash. So EM rash and positive lab tests are reportable in Wisconsin. And really the, the, the way that they would do that is they would go into our disease surveillance system and enter a report, you know, with the patient diet demographics and, and the information on the clinical diagnosis. Um, and then we would receive that report and be able to, to do an investigation and count that case. Um, something, it, that process has to happen manually right now. You know, a person has to go into our system and enter the data and submit it. It doesn't take long, but when you have, you know, a lot of cases of other <laughs> communicable diseases to report, it, it can take some time and it, and it is a burden on, on healthcare providers. So we are working on an automated system um, that we're really excited about that would essentially automatically report the medical chart, you know, sort of a, a history with clinical details. Um, if a, if a provider diagnoses someone with Lyme who has EM rash. So um, that might improve our reporting and, and allow us to catch more cases for, for surveillance purposes. Excellent. Well, we have time for one more question. Um, while we're listening to the answer, I did put a link into an anonymous evaluation of the program. So you can tell us things that you learned today and other things that you'd like to learn. So you can click on that link while we're listening to the answer to a question from Teresa. How does a doctor know which tick disease to test for? Can a person be tested for more than one tick-related tick disease at the first doctor's visit? Yeah, great question. Um, you know, some of this is going to depend on, um, you know, of course, what symptoms you're presenting with. If somebody comes in with EM rash um, that is diagnostic of Lyme, you know, your doctor might say, oh, you have Lyme, I'm going to treat you with doxycycline. Um, take it and, and, you know, report back if you, if you don't feel better. Um, and like I mentioned before on that co-infection slide, Doxycycline is kind of the first line antibiotic for Lyme and most other tick-borne diseases that are caused by bacteria. So that would include anaplasmosis, ehrlichiosis, even Borrelia miyamotoi disease. Um, and, and so if you happen to have, say, say you happen to have a co-infection or maybe you come into your doctor and you don't have the EM rash, but you have a, you know, a known tick bite and you're feeling kind of flu-like symptoms, um, if you're treated with doxycycline, typically that's going to be effective treatment and you're going to feel better. Um, and at the time of the first visit, it's, it's really sort of a discussion between you and your doctor about what testing you might want and what mm -hmm. testing is indicated. Um, some of it has to do with, uh, access to testing. If you're, you know, if you, the particular clinic or hospital that you're going to, um, they may not have every test available, but we recommend you know, ideally you would get tested for essentially a, using a tick-borne panel that would look for, if this is especially early on in disease, that would be a PCR test. So that's again, one of those direct detection tests for anaplasma, Ehrlichia, Babesia. Um, and potentially you could do Lyme antibody testing as well, depending on kind of when in your course of illness uh, you are. And it's just important to know that again, if it's early and you test negative on a Lyme test, that doesn't mean you don't have Lyme. Um, so I always encourage providers, so clinicians to, to try their best to test for more than just Lyme disease. And I think as a patient, if you're concerned about tick-borne disease, um, I would certainly recommend you advocate for that. Um, Especially if you feel like, you know, there's a little bit of, of uh, you know, if your symptoms are really nonspecific and it's not clear, like if you don't have EM rash, but it's possible you still have Lyme disease, but it's also possible you could have one of these other diseases, um, especially for babesiosis, uh, which does require a different treatment uh, regimen. Uh, 
uh, it's important to get a specific diagnosis for that one, especially because doxycycline is not going to be effective for, for treating babesiosis. So ask your doctor about a tick-borne panel and mention these other diseases if you can, um, and just ask them about options for testing. Um, there's no reason why they can't order sort of a whole, a whole host of tick-borne disease tests right off the bat. Um, and it, you know, it should be, depending on your insurance, you know, it should be covered um, as diagnostic testing. So we really encourage that approach if at all possible. Well, Rebecca, thank you so much for all of your information this morning. I know I've learned a lot from you about all these different types of illnesses that ticks can transplant or transmit and um, how we have to be vigilant and watchful during tick season, which is most of the year in Wisconsin anymore, but keeping an eye out for the ticks is our best prevention to keep them off your body as much as possible. But you've given us lots of information about what to do if we do find, find a tick bite. So thanks so much for being our speaker. Thanks to Amy Nozel for your help running this morning program. Uh, appreciate everybody joining us this morning. This today, I will send a follow-up email with the link to where we will post the recording when it's ready and a list of all of the links that we've put into the chat today so you can do some more reading on your own. So appreciate it. Everybody be safe out there in tick country and have a great day today.